Here we are back at the assembly bench, aka the kitchen table, and I have in front of me the case that has been pre-drilled and prepped for final assembly. Inside the case I have the little pocket packet of screws that holds the cover on. I'm going to set those aside for now with the cover. I put the heat sink that was matched with the holes that I drilled so that they align perfectly when I line them up. But first I want to show you one of the most important steps in creating a good connection for this pulse width modulator. The most critical connection is this piece of wire right here, R12. And more specifically, all your connections to this ring terminal. I'm going to zoom in really close because this is so important. I need you to pay attention to this. Now if I can only get it to focus. Let's do it this way. All right, you can see that this ring terminal has been crimped and it has been soldered to the end of the 14 gauge wire. It is extremely important that all of your connections to the ring terminals and the screw terminals that exit the box are extremely clean, tight, and soldered as well as you can. Any resistance that is generated by a poor contact is going to result in heat and loss of efficiency of your pulse width modulator circuit and it will not perform as you expect it to perform. Extremely, extremely important. This is the 6 inch 14 gauge wire that, com that creates R12. This is the wire that is the jumper bus bar for the drains, the MOS power MOSFET drain leads inside the case. I'll show you how to bend that later. And then for the positive input terminal, all we have is just the ring terminal with, with a screw going through it. And I'm going to assemble these for you. Now because these are so important, and I, and I cannot stress this enough. I'm going to show you very carefully and up close how I do this. So please bear with me because this is a very important step. Here's the ring terminal. Here's my 1024 by 1 inch steel screw. And I'm going to send it through the ring terminal like so. All right flip it over, then I'm going to put a lock washer down the threads, and then a 1024 hex nut by 3 8 drive. Now, what I do is I pre-tighten it to partially compress the split lock washer, but here's the step that's important. Taking my 3 8 inch box wrench and I'm setting the screw into the box wrench opening and I'm letting it rest on my work surface which in this case is just a uh, manila folder that I use to protect the kitchen table. My screwdriver is a Phillips head screwdriver All right. and I set that in the head and by setting it on top of the, the manila folder like this, I'm able to, to lean heavily on the top of the head of the screw so that I can exert a lot of force as I tighten this down and get it as tight <coughs> as I can. Without breaking the screw or the or stripping it. Okay? Extremely important. Now one of the things I'm going to point out here is as I assemble this to the case there are times where when you take the nut on the outside of the case and tighten it down you can actually spin the screw head and the nut will remain stationary 
If that happens, what, what that does is it loosens up this mechanical connection and you have to start over again. You have to, you have to create a very, very tight uh, compression fit on the head of this screw in, in order to maintain a very solid electrical connection. Again, any, any lack of... Uh, again, any resistance that is created by a poor mechanical connection here will result in heat, will result in voltage loss, and will result in poor performance of your pulse width modulator. The same is true also for the terminal that acts as the bus bar to join the drain to the outside of the case. So now that I've created my ring terminals, oh, one other thing I want to show you before I forget. This is an example of a double wire R12, which I'm going to be using in this particular build because I'm building a 150 amp version of the pulse width modulator circuit. So to give you an idea of what that compression fitting looks like, come on focus. There we go. Alright, you see the head of the screw on top. The two ring terminals back to back, a lock washer, and then the hex nut. And I've assembled it the same way, extremely tight, as tight as I can get it with my box wrench and screwdriver. So the first step is to apply the heatsink compound to the back of the heatsink. Now, I know that opposite, where are my MOSFETs? On the opposite side of the case, on the top of the case, the MOSFETs are going to mount this way on the heatsink, or underneath the heatsink, I should say. All right. The location where the greatest amount of heat is generated on the power MOSFET is in this area right here. So where I want to make sure I apply my heatsink compound is to this area on the heatsink underneath where each MOSFET will be opposite. All right, And I also put a little dab in the, in the very center. Here's my heatsink compound, and really just a tiny little dab will do you because as soon as you compress it to the top of the case, it will ooze out. All right, so just to give you an idea of how little you really need, just a tiny bit like that. And one more in the middle for good measure. To position the heatsink, the first screw that I will put in is the screw for the ring terminal that acts as the ground point for C7 and C5, the 12,000 microfarad stiffening capacitor and the 4.7 polyester film. This is the ring terminal that I'm going to assemble. And I'm using my 632 by 3 quarter inch long screw with a split lock washer and a number 6 flat washer.